Hello, and welcome to Electrifying Growth, a podcast brought to you by Edison Partners. I'm Chris Sugden, the managing partner here at Edison and your host. There are moments in a person or company's journey that are undeniably electric. The spark or sparks, if you will, that propel you or your company to new heights. With Electrifying Growth, we're here to have in-depth, real conversations with great leaders who have been there and done it before. Edison has been investing in high growth technology companies for more than 35 years, and I've been here at Edison doing this investing piece for more than 20 years. We've led over 225 investments. We understand that it takes great leaders and visionaries to build market leaders. We are your support system, a CEO and management's entourage, if you will. Let's introduce this episode's guest. Welcome to another edition of Electrifying Growth. I'm your host, Chris Sugden. Today, I'm thrilled to have a visionary and innovator in the digital payment space and really an innovator in general. Yusuf Kasim is our guest today. Yusuf is the president of the payments optimization business at Zealous, where he experienced strategy and operations to elevate Zealous's leadership in payments and communications. His journey with Zealous has been long, started long before his current role. He was with an original company called PHX and actually co-founded what is today the payments business called PayPlus Solutions. That was a subsidiary that started in 2011. PayPlus has evolved into the core of the Zealous payment business. And as you'll hear on the podcast, the billions of dollars the company now moves is, is pretty phenomenal. Yusuf played a pivotal role in the foundational merger with Redcard in 2019, and he helped to create the powerhouse that Zealous is today, the leading provider in healthcare payments. With over 20 years of experience as a serial entrepreneur, by the way, you'll hear he started his first business when he was 16, including founding his first company in college. Yusuf has been at the forefront of innovation across technology, financial services, and healthcare. Today, we'll hear Yusuf's journey, his learning, his first IT startup, Digital FX, to becoming a leader in the healthcare payments industry. His thoughts on the future of digital payments, of healthcare, and just being a leader are really worth it. So without further ado, Yusuf Kasim, thank you so much for joining Electrifying Growth today. How are you? I'm doing great, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm, I've been thrilled and honored to join this one. You have some pretty heavy hitters join this, and so just thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, not only Yusuf, but Zell's the heavy hitter itself, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into, but we are happy to have you because I think the bottom line is this whole podcast theme is it's all about the entrepreneur and you guys make it rain and do all the hard work. And sometimes the, the investors get too much credit, but I'd love to start with because you've got kind of an entrepreneur in your blood. I hope I have it right. I know I do, but you started a business pretty early days, all the way back to college. Just give us the use of story from entrepreneur to scaled operator. Yeah, it goes a little bit before college. So um, I really started being an entrepreneur when I was 16. I worked for my dad one summer and I realized, you know, manual labor was not my thing. And so I quickly got humbled and realized that I needed to find another way to, to use my brain to start a career. So I taught myself how to code when I was 16. Started a business with my buddies and we ended up selling it when we were 18. It actually grew too fast and we were too young to know what to deal with it. So we ended up selling it and that was really where the, where the fire and the fuel really started. And just the excitement of building something and running something at a young age just really got me going. And so fast forward, we got a little smarter, got an investor, started another size business to kind of manage technology and payments. So I did that throughout college. It was great to have a job in college and not to do anything outside. And so really carried my career throughout and then post-college kept it going. But at the time, networking was one of those big things. And I was always looking for new mentors because I didn't have that many at a young age and got introduced to a relationship to say, hey, you know, you know, technology, no payments. What about healthcare and payments? And I said, I knew nothing about healthcare. I knew a lot about payments. And so that was really the start of at the time was called Pay Plus Solutions, which ultimately became the payments business for Zealous. Fantastic. Love that. You kept that concise with so many twists and turns in there. What was the code way back when? What did you learn to code in? Uh, I don't know if I want to date myself, but I had it all. You know, C Sharp. They had PHP back then, SQL, mostly C Sharp, but it's evolved. You probably don't want me coding anymore right now. But it was even HTML, whatever it took to make a website, make it run. I figured it out. So for those who don't know, we're not going to go right to Zealous right away, but Zealous, Z-E-L-I-S for the, the listening audience and those watching is the leading healthcare payments company, price optimization company. I like to say in the world, but healthcare is a, a very US centric model when you think about the way healthcare is delivered. But before we do that, let's talk about mentorship. You also mentioned networking. I don't think you just meant computer networking. I think you meant networking, networking, right? I know you had a great mentor because I know who it is, and, or at least one of them. He kind of recognized your abilities early. You know, hey, this is someone we've got to keep around and develop. 
just talk about that relationship and maybe even how you've continued to apply it, how you change mentors. Talk to younger folks who might be listening about how they should go about that, how they should value it. Yeah, we'll get to the mentor in a minute, but you know, being at that age, you know, thinking you know things or you're having some level of early success. I was also a big soccer player. I mean, I found all the inspiration in and around me, both good and bad. I knew what great looked like, and I also knew what bad looked like. And so even the ones that I didn't necessarily want to model myself after, I used that as part of building who I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. Coming from a middle-class family, you're always looking to kind of look above and figure out what that is. And I was very fortunate at a few, select few mentors that they just brought the energy and passion and they were really good humans. And that was really what inspired me. It wasn't their success or how much money they had or the cars that they drove. They really just cared and they motivated you in just a, such a different way. That was what inspired me to like be that person. And yes, everything else would come. And I live that today. If you're having, you know, one of the mantras of one of those mentors is if you're having fun and doing something special with people that you love, the success and everything and the money will come from them. And it's not just about money, right? It's just, again, just you're doing the right thing. And he, at that time, they hit a level and they hit a milestone in their career that just really inspired me. And that is really what I wanted to be. That's who I wanted to be. It's who I try to be today to everyone. And so for those that are looking for mentors, it's not just some level. It's people who deeply care that are good humans in and out and that motivate you. They're going to give you the tough love. They're not just going to give you the happy stuff. Like they're going to hit you hard and, and make you better, but they're doing it because they care and they want to see you and whoever else around you succeed. Organic mentoring versus kind of programs. You know, Zealous isn't a big company, but it's a pretty big company. I say that because there are huge companies out there. Some companies that they kind of program it and it's inorganic and you get assigned a mentor. There's also the inorganic mentoring. What have you found to be most effective? And then also sort of follow up to that. How do you go about mentoring young people? Because I'm sure you're now in the pay it forward mode. You're like, I need to do this for somebody else. Yeah, you know, we're probably still evolving our organic mentoring to some degree. And I think we've started and stopped different programs. Um, and we're learning as we go what works and what doesn't. I personally thrive on the inorganic, but you want to be somewhat intentional in giving that advice and creating that room. Because listen, successful people, they don't have a lot of time. Time is finite. In some ways, it's a forcing mechanism to use their time, but use it wisely. So when you get the window, use it all, right? But on the other hand, I think inorganic, it allows you to have a diverse set of perspectives and relationships as well, right? You're not just going to get all of your secret sauce, all of this recipes from one person or one human being. You're going to get it from a lot of people and you got to find where you can pull certain things on, right? Where are you going to get your sales mentorship or marketing or where you're going to get your operational sort of chops? Like there's just all different ways. And so just trying to find those little but big meaningful things out of those. I personally get a lot out of that, but I think the, the organic can set a direction, set some goals and objectives of what you're looking to get out of this and what your mentor or mentee can actually do for you. But I'd probably go probably 60, 40, 70, 30 more on the inorganic side because there's just so much to learn and you can get a lot more real quickly. One more on this topic. What is your advice to a young person in going about seeking out or having an effective mentor in their life, if you will, professional mentor, of course? What's your advice to a young person? Treat it as a two-way relationship. It's not one way. Believe it or not, just because you're someone's mentor doesn't mean they cannot learn from you. You take her. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I would just say when you're looking for that right relationship, make it both ways. Like you can also help them along the journey. You could also help them see what you're seeing or what your generation's seeing. And so look at it as a bi-directional because it can be a give and take relationship and everybody can benefit from it. Love it. So we mentioned Zealous, we mentioned payments and, and you mentioned Pay Plus. PHX was the original baby here. Talk about a little bit of the, the founding story of Pay Plus because you were there from pretty much the start of this, wait a minute, these healthcare bills, claims, as we call them, someone's got to pay them. What's going on? Talk about that a bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. I mean, at the time, there was roughly billions of dollars of healthcare claims that were going out via check. And one of the PHX founders sort of identified this use case and said, hey, like a lot of our customers are payers, insurance payers. We're looking to sort of save money and find a new innovative way. And so, you know, I'm probably a little cocky use of like, what? This is so easy. I got this. I got this. Like <laughs> we could do this overnight. And here I am 13 years later, more humbled and not, not as much cocky. I still find it true. I, I write a lot of articles for Forbes Business Council and I put a lot of things on my LinkedIn. Healthcare is one of the most unique and complex industries in all of the world. And it is probably the slowest to adopt 
things around administrative complexity and administrative burden, right? There's so many advancements happening in medical, but actually, if you look at the back office, it is like the 90s and it's a mess. And it's sad. At the time, you know, we had an opportunity to fix the problem. We probably started one off and said, hey, we're going to go at this, create a better user experience. We're going to go out with one payment modality and we're going to try just electronify everything in healthcare. And fast forward, that is not the business today. Along the way, it's been hours. You know, we've made really intentional and strategic bets to bring more of an offering to pivot and understand like this isn't a one size fits all. And we really need to go really deep in understanding the problem to really solve the solution. And so along the 10 plus years, we've done a lot of innovation. We've done a lot of acquisitions and partnerships along the way. And I'm really happy to say today, we are the leading healthcare payments company in the country, right? We've done a lot to help really transform and modernize the healthcare financial journey and experience. And we're impacting and helping several hundred payers, hundreds of thousands of providers. And as of today, we're moving roughly $240 billion in payments. You stole my follow-up because being a private company, the what can you tell the world? Give us that number again. $240 billion we help transact and process in healthcare today. Amazing. From literally the first payment. How do we do this, right? So when you think about where this goes, you know, the trying to marry the kind of this conversation with not getting too geeked out on payments because we both love it. But where are we today in the healthcare system of, to your point, back office modernization? I don't know, zero to 10 is a way to think about it. The ending of a baseball game. Like where else is the opportunity in payments, if you will, as you think about the world you're living in? Yeah, honestly, I, I would say externally, the answer is probably an eight. I think for Zealous and Yusuf, we continue to have high ambitions and we know just how far we can go because I'd say if we got to 10, we'd want to get to 20, right? So given where we're at, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're an investor in Zealous. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm serious, right? Like given the scale and growth that we've had and the impact, it is pretty amazing in what we're doing in terms of the impact we're having today. But we shouldn't stop at success and we shouldn't stop at sort of where we're going or want to go in the next three to five years. There's so much opportunity we can do to get into transform. And I don't want to be here three or five years from now saying healthcare is still a laggard. I don't want to do that. I want to say, hey, there's other industries that are now looking at the gold standard because healthcare moved faster than anybody else. I almost think this is a trite question when you're talking tech and you're talking podcast, but AI is like, it's almost malpractice not to talk about it. It's almost like cliche to talk about it. Where is AI in the, the landscape of what we do and how do you think it's going to impact our industry? Yeah, I'd say for the industry as a whole, there's a lot of good momentum. There's a ton of activity happening, I think, in certain use cases. I would say, unfortunately, with healthcare, I still think it's early days, but health, AI is being applied in a lot of different areas solely around care, right? You're hearing some of the tools that we're giving doctors and hospitals to dramatically change or accelerate, you know, identification of things. So, like, I would say in, in the right areas, things are moving really quickly and there's only so much we can do. I'd say on the administrative and back office, we're probably still early days and we want to also be thoughtful in making sure it's we're doing it the right way in a thoughtful way and also in a secure way. And so there's a lot of opportunity there, Chris. And I think you're going to start to see a lot of that. You know, at Zealous, we are working on those things. There's things that are already happening in, in some way, shape or form. But I'd say that is another runway to add even on top of, you know, going from good to great in terms of the back office and modernizing the areas that Zealous touches. Talk about team and culture, like the zealous culture is, I go, it goes all the way back to PHX, frankly, and we go way back and you, we kind of joked about it for, for disclosure. I sometimes use the readout of the introduction. We, we had a center investors in zealous. It's, it's a privilege because it's a really special company in terms of the financial return that it's delivered to our firm. But the team and culture has always struck me as pretty unique in how strong it is. And people are struggling with this out of COVID and you guys have figured it out, so to speak, but it's, it's never done, right? It's always evolving, but what makes the zealous culture special, if you will? It's hard to explain in words. Sometimes you have to feel it. And Chris, as you know, I mean, you've been here with us on this journey for over a decade. And I know you get to feel it and see it just in some of the updates that we do. But it is the heart and the DNA of the organization. To see the growth, to see the results. I mean, that's awesome, right? But that doesn't happen without our culture. And we've continued to double down and invest in doing that and maintaining it. Um, it doesn't just happen with me. It happens with all the operating committee members, Amanda, our CEO. I'm sure she talked about that, but like that is the heart blood. And coming from where we were, you know, we were a very small company. Payments was started. I think we're about a hundred employees and today we're over 2,800, right? And 
I joined the company because I was entrepreneurial and I, I saw that entrepreneurism could exist in a hundred person company. And here we are 2,800 people later. And I know that we can continue to maintain and exist. And I thank not just you, but the rest of our board to allow us to embrace that as well, because it's seen in the results. It's seen in a lot of the accolades and, and a lot of the recognitions that we get around great places to work, right? Associated engagement scores, like you see it in all different ways. And it's a big talent magnet for us, but beyond just acquiring talent, what it allows us to do is also maintain talent, right? And again, I come back to just the little examples when you can get on a call or be in a meeting and you can all vibe out and have a lot of fun. There is nothing you can't get done. I'm sorry. Like you can't, right? It's that, that is the entrepreneurial mindset. Like just take the hill. Just take the hill. And you know what? We're going to put our arms around each other and we're going to all have fun. And you wouldn't have think, you know, you'd have these relationships probably at work. But I, I say like, you spend more time in your work life than you do in sometimes your personal life, right? And you have to make sure those relationships are as important and exist because that's what makes it. And that's what brings the energy, the enthusiasm and allows you to go home at night and talk about work, right? And be proud of where you work as well. When people stop valuing the relationship, it's when it becomes a big company bureaucracy and the culture probably starts to wane. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Totally. When you think about your own journey, like literally, okay, 16-year-old entrepreneur building some cool stuff, but even you enter Play Plus and PHX, it's like you're wearing every hat, little tiny company. You want to get something done, you go do it. 2,800 people, not quite half, but close to that are in your organization, right? You think about yeah. it. So you've somehow figured out a way to scale from skunk work, SEAL team to a thousand plus people, sounds most associates, I guess we, we call them, right? Team members. What's been the biggest challenge in that? Just having that many people under your purview, if you will. It's a huge responsibility for a whole host of reasons. And, you know, you want to balance, I think for me personally, that's a big jump, right? Not many do it and I haven't done it before. So I'm kind of writing my own playbook as I go through that journey. It's being patient. It's, again, I come back to understanding your core values. And I think as long as you don't change yourself or think you have to act like a different person and you can still stay true to yourself, but stay true to everybody else in the organization and be that person across the board and, and being consistent, I think it helps go a long way. I can be humbled around learning a new process, learning a new approach, obviously wanting to deal with you know global expansion and, and just given the fact that we have this level of associates, it's just... Take the time to learn for yourself, but be open and honest on where your soft spots are and where you need time to maybe take the next action or make the next decision, right? You don't have to do everything overnight, but there's really a lot of people around you that want to support you and also prop you up and make sure they're helping you on that journey and helping you mature as a leader. I'm trying to always learn. You should never stop learning, right? And one of the things that I took out of watching other PE firms that come in behind us one of the firms to me did a great job with the use of coaches and making it really, there's, it, it wasn't optional. It was like, everyone gets a coach. If you're going to be an executive yeah. in our company, at least that's how I felt like I've seen it. Talk about that. Cause it wasn't like, you know, before they showed up, there was a, a formal coaching program. Some people think it's hokey. Some people are like, oh, they're making us do this. I think for you, I know I've heard it's been hugely valuable. Talk about co the importance of, and I always say, you know, if Tiger Woods had a swing coach, <laughs> we can all use a coach or a Tom Brady one, but what's your view of, how it works, good, bad, how to have smaller companies embrace it, et cetera, et cetera. If you're not embracing it, it's the most underutilized asset that should be utilized, number one. It was new to me. Today, I don't have one coach. I actually have three. I have my triathlon coach. <laughs> and then I have I actually have two additional executive coaches. I'd say one is a hybrid. It's for me and my team. And one is personally for me as well. So that just shows I've gone from zero to now two in the workplace and one, one for my personal self, which applies, I think, to the workplace as well. And so it's been one of the most transformative experiences for myself. I probably wouldn't be able to sustain the level of growth that we have and the scale that we've had. What, what does, I'm pretty sure it's she, what does she do? Let's call it more the business use of coach, not your team coach and not your triathlon coach, without giving too much away of the, I don't know, that's part of the secret sauce. But at the same time, people are like, I don't even know what that means to have a business coach. Someone who's helped me in my professional development. I will say it's almost like the Wendy Rhodes in Billions, but it's not the Wendy Rhodes in Billions. So, um, and listen, it's someone who can immerse and understand the business in a much more level of depth. And I would say it's definitely not shrink. And it's more someone who understands some of your cycle metrics. They use different profiles, again, whether you're using Hogan or something else, right? Or DISC or things like that. But they will obtain all this data, but also make it, qualitative as well as quantitative. 
and really start to help you understand and navigate things. They're not going to give you the answer, but imagine having a coach who not just coaches Yusuf, but coaches 10 other senior executives in 10 other industries. Nine times out of 10, the problem that you're dealing with is the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. And so that is one element, but it's also one element that just, again, you can have someone with an objective view that you can share challenges or issues or obstacles, and they help you think. They know how you think. Well, they force you to think. They force you to think about things you weren't necessarily thinking about either. Exactly. They're not going to give you the answer, but they're going to force you to think. And again, it allows you to maybe pull out of being in the bunker a little bit and do it with someone else who's really designed to help you get through or think through something externally. I'm on a bit of a crusade because I, it wasn't just watching what's happening at Zealous and the firm you were using and actually the person you were using, because I'll do a shameless plug. Julie Moore is probably as good as they get in this world. She was on the podcast and believe it or not, I think I called her that episode, The Real Life, Wendy Rhodes. Said, <laughs> you just said it. So for those who are listening and are kind of intrigued by this, you give that podcast a listen, but I'm on a, on a mission to say, if you've gotten, I don't know if you're north of 20 million, 50 million in revenue, certainly if you're a hundred million and you're not getting a coach, you're just missing so much opportunity. If you can share, what's an aha moment from those either team sessions or personal sessions? What's a, an unlock as they might say, if it's not too personal. Well, first of all, since you did a shameless plug, I'll do a shameless plug. Julie Moore, what's up? Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. Right. Um, at one point, I had Julie talk to my whole team one-on-one. -on -one. You did a 360. I did a 360. And it was the most powerful thing, not just for me, but then what I did is I shared the 360 back with everybody else. You had the willingness to do that. Yeah, you got to. If you're going to give me input and feedback, I need to play it back to you because team effectiveness and understanding my areas of deficiencies or where I need to grow, that is why you do a 360. You don't just do it to put it on a shelf. You take action, right? And so- not only was that more insightful, but it also helped my team know where they can help or where they need to adjust. What really came out of that is then all my other team members or leaders wanted to do their own 360 and do the same thing. That was not the intent or design. I really just did it for myself. And I would say that's been one of the biggest unlocks. You think about team effectiveness, culture, again, all the things that matter to help grow a thriving, growing, fast-paced organization. Everybody's in. Everyone was Every in. Everybody's in. It's an interesting, this 360, so many times people are afraid of feedback. The other part is, what have you done to give your team the willingness to speak up? How do you create trust? And I know it's a complicated question, but you need a trusting relationship for people to give the feedback. Even if you tell them it's confidential, you, people are still nervous, right? I kind of always say, tell everybody, and this is any relationships, like you have my trust until you lose it. So I put the pressure on early on and I, I truly mean it, right? If you're joining a leadership team and you've gone through and You've been selected and the chosen one, like that's it. It's really unfortunate when you lose it. Again, I don't, everyone can have their own different approach, but I, I lean in with that because pressure is a privilege. And if you're going to earn the trust of a senior leader or another relationship that you respect, you better maintain it. And so that for me is a big unlock because then we're all in together. So we talked about culture. It's been a high performing culture from early days and it is sustained. One of my favorite kind of zealous, you may, I hope I'm not being cliche if I said it too many times, but. There's um hashtag GSD, maybe it's just GSD. First of all, you should share what it stands for, but how does it kind of manifest itself in real life? Yeah, well, it stand, depends on, on who, who, who the audience is, but get stuff done. Oh, and you weren't going to say get shit done? Uh, I love to say get shit done. You know, <laughs> I, I can't leave a conversation without dropping something. Yes, it means get shit done. You talk about the early days of PHX Pay Plus, and one of the things we always had a lot of good credit on from our clients and our associates is we found a way to get it done. And that allowed us to win and grow and retain a lot of our customers. That has now cascaded, which I give you know a ton amount of credit on the operating committee and, and Amanda, our CEO, because she's allowed us to still embrace that, right? It is something that people just love. I mean, who doesn't love when you can just get stuff done, right? And you can't do it at all times. You have to find process and stuff. But if you keep that in your mantra and you keep that in your ethos, you're always going to find a way, right? And again, I think it's one that, it's made us a huge differentiator in the marketplace. And I care about it most because our clients know us, right? When they know Zealous, that's really how one of the names got this, you know, was created by is they get it done, right? One way or the other, they're going to find a way. And it's also just a fun unlock. You know, when you could put hashtag GSD or let's get it done. I mean, people follow that, right? You create a wave and an inertia that can't be stopped. And so I love it. It is one of the best 
zealousisms. I don't know. I don't even know what we call them. I don't think you guys use that. You can use it and, you know, just yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, thank you. I'll take that one. But no, it makes a difference. You touched on triathlons and I know you're uh, a really proud father and, and a great dad at that. Is triathlons what you do for fun? I mean, most people think that's a little bit massive, but. I grew up playing soccer my whole life. And I realized like adult soccer was probably not the smartest thing because you, you end up getting hurt a lot more. And so I did transition triathlons and I love it for a couple of things. A, I don't know how I do it for fun, but I, I love endurance racing. I wasn't good in any one of those three sports, swimming, biking, or running. And I had to learn how to get good at all three. And it's really cascaded to how I treat business. I think businesses are endurance sports. For a full Ironman, the number one advice, they would say something's going to go wrong and what are you going to do about it, right? And it's mostly mental than it is physical, believe it or not. And it doesn't matter how fast. That day, everybody's looking to finish. That day, everybody's cheering each other on. And while you're working on your own journey, everybody along the way has had their own and they're all coming together on that day to celebrate the milestone. Like the race is the milestone and the accomplishment. It's what's taking you, because it's a big commitment. It's a big family. You know, you got a lot of hours of training, 15, 20 hours a week injuries, whatever else you have going on, but you set a goal, you find a way to make it happen and get it done. And it's truly, it has a lot of, I'd say, uh, similarities to businesses, right? The business and life, I suppose. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a triathlon. Exactly. What's the hardest of the three? I think the running off the bike is the most fun, but it's the hardest. I mean, imagine swimming 2.4 miles, riding 112 miles on a bike. And all you want to do is get off the bike. And then it's like, oh, wait, now you got to run a marathon all in one day. There's a lot that goes through your head that late in a race. And so it is the most hardest, but it's the most rewarding because you can finish. And if you keep putting one step forward, you're going to get it done. Would that be your answer no matter what was last? Is it the fact it's last or it's the fact it's a marathon? <laughs> I mean, it's funny. My son may be calling you. He has become now a, a marathon and he's threatening to do a, a triathlon. I'm, I'm sure he will because he's got your mindset, like just keep running through the wall. So you may have a, someone looking for some mentorship on the triathlon side soon. I'll, from, I'll, from I'll take him on a ride. Yeah, I got to humble him though, you know, just make sure you know what he's signing up for. That's right. That's right. Um, so I, I love this question. My second startup was literally published a magazine and we had this great column. It was when I was 25 and we had all these great celebrities write their own piece. Sometimes we go through it a forum, but really cool celebrities that have been big successes and business people, et cetera. So I like to use this to say, whether it's business, life, whatever it is, what does the Yusuf of today wish the Yusuf when he was 25 knew? Not so much of what would you do different. What does wisdom and time tell you you wish you'd someone had told you back then? Yeah, I would not do anything different, even if you asked me that. I would tell the 25-year-old Yusuf, no different than my seven-year-old son, embrace every minute of every day. It goes by super fast. And if you can wake up every day and, you know, with a smile, being a good human being, Everything else will ha find a funny way of working itself out. It's hard to believe in the moment, but if you can stick to those mantras and really just enjoy it and embrace every minute and learn from every minute of every day, good things are really going to come. It's hard to argue with that. There's some stoicism and there's some motivation in that as well because you can't control everything, right? You can control no. you can control. And just putting it down to the business, you think 25, you want to get to this level. You want to like make this much money or you want to, you know, you want to grow and start a business and like, there's so much to learn in each of those moments that you don't. So just stay in it for a minute. And as long as you're doing the right thing and you're working hard, it really will work itself out, right? Love it. My last kind of, I'm going to flip this as a, that was actually about business too, but this one's really specific about business. I know you think of it as a privilege, but it's actually a privilege to have people like you willing to serve on boards. And I mean that, I think having the most powerful thing Edison does to me is we stock our boards with other people who've been there, done it and or doing it you're on a pretty cool board because there's some really good people that, that have been there and done it. So this question is kind of use that as a frame maybe. And that is early stage growth stage CEOs, something they almost always do that they should not do and advice to those early stage kind of growth CEOs. You've seen now as a board member, this movie. So I bet your advice is even better now than it was even a couple of years ago. Yeah. I think Edison has created the dynamic or particularly in the board that I'm on or get to witness a really good group of diverse individuals that have a lot of experiences think about mentorships and i would say any early stage or growth organization your board is there to actually help you a lot of them are intimidated oh they just sent me an email or pick up you know they're just calling me like oh i don't know if i could tell them it's like use them more than you think it's an untapped resource and they are really there to help work through navigate challenges create opportunities you know flip it back have them help you know in different areas and so 
they're there to not judge or be there and meet you every three months. And I know, Chris, that's one of Edison's things, right? The minute I start acting like a board member, like I shouldn't be here. So I truly believe like use them to your full extent as a mentor, as a thought partner, right? Along your journey. It's it's such great advice. I honestly couldn't say it better myself. I think the idea that these people are there to help versus evaluate. And at the end of the day, the funny thing is we're all being evaluated because if you don't deliver, it doesn't matter. But your point, it is a very common theme where you go, the board meetings become this command performance rather than a let's get to the issues. So I appreciate what you said and I, I hope I'm living it and I'm glad to hear that's the way you think about this board interaction. You know, time flies, you're having fun. What I would say, and I said this even kind of before we were doing the pre kind of meet, if you will, what you guys have done at Zelfs is, I say this with all just true respect, there are unicorns that are fake because they literally d- did nothing with the money. What you guys have done with so little money, if you will, it's such a big company. They say the world's about to find out. I think what the world doesn't know is how special the business is, but what you have done, what a man has done, what the team has done is, is remarkable. And it was a chance to meet someone at Zealous and get to know what's going on there. It's, it's a company that should be sort of studied and is going to be a case study at one point. So thank you for being a guest today. It's sort of one of my products, not only deals, but association of the people that are there. So keep doing it. And as you can see on this, whether you're watching or just listening, the energy Yusuf brings, this isn't podcast energy. This is like this is real life. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to keep up with them. But thank you so much for joining me today. Look forward to unbelievable great things ahead. I, the next triathlon we'll be watching. Awesome. Chris, thank you again for having me. It's been awesome. I can't believe it. time does fly when you're having fun. But congratulations on all innocent success. I love this podcast. Big fan. And just thank you all. And honestly, thank you to everybody at Zealous that allows us to do what they do every day to talk about our results, talk about our performance, talk about our growth. Like we don't do it alone. All 2,800 strong allow us to have this and be proud of what we've created and looking forward to for folks to really know more. Well said. Thanks again, Yusuf. Have a great day. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for joining this episode of Electrifying Growth. A special thanks to this week's guest for sharing their time and insight. For more resources, inspiration, and a look inside the Edison Partners Network, sign up for our newsletter at www.edisonpartners.com. Click on the Stay in the Know button in the top right corner of our webpage. Thank you again.